Well, welcome to worship here online at St. Germain Evangelical Free Church. If you're new, I'm Pastor Josh. We're glad that you have chosen to join us in this way. Uh, if you are uh, watching this on Sunday morning, it is Palm Sunday, a week before Easter. And I just want to give you a few updates in the life of our church. First of all, we are going to begin to provide this uh, sermon as a worship opportunity for you first thing on Sunday morning. Uh, we have been recording live and then posting Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening. We're going to go back to recording this sermon ahead of time and providing it for you first thing Sunday morning. So we're happy to be able to do that, and this is the first time back doing that in a while. A couple other updates for you. If you are in the Northwoods this coming week, we have some opportunities. A senior luncheon for those 55 and older. We keep notching that age down. It was at 65, and then it was at 60. Now it's at 55. Uh, next year, I'm going to be 50, so I'm creeping up on that age. We'll see if I ever catch it. Uh, but the senior luncheon is for those 55 and older. It's this Wednesday at noon. Please contact the church if you're planning to come. They just want a sense of numbers. Uh, the Good Friday service is coming up this Friday. It is at 6 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Uh, our tradition on Good Friday is that it is a, a quiet, somewhat somber uh, time of reflection and worship as we recognize the death of our Savior on the cross and prepare our hearts uh, to celebrate his resurrection on Easter Sunday morning. So the Good Friday service is here at 6 p.m. this Friday. No child care during that uh, service. We're all going to be gathered together. And then Easter services are next Sunday at our normal worship gathering times, 8.30 a.m. and 10.15 a.m. Parents, at that 10.15 service, your children will again be in their uh, classrooms for the entire hour, so you can drop them off right away if you're coming to worship in person, and we're excited for this coming Easter season and to celebrate our risen Lord. Last update for you, uh, as some of you may know, we uh, feel the Lord has called us to plant a campus in the Rhinelander area to partner with Highland Community Church and plant this campus, and just this last week, we have hired a campus pastor, uh, Justin Olson has agreed to be our Rhinelander campus pastor. If you don't know Justin, uh, he is currently on staff with Fort Wilderness. He and his wife Kelly have lived in the Rhinelander area for a long time. Kelly grew up in the Rhinelander area. They have a heart for Rhinelander. And Justin is just a good guy. He loves the Lord. He loves his wife and his three little daughters. And uh, we're excited to be partnering together with him. He begins um, in a dual role uh, one day a week as that uh, campus pastor, May 22nd, and then full-time in that role, August 1st. And our goal is to see that campus launched by the end of this year. So that's an update for you. We're excited about what God is doing. Again, welcome to worship. We're really glad that you've joined us. Well, if you've got a Bible, please turn with me to James 3, verses 13 to 18. And as you do, I've got a question for you. It's sort of a conversation starter question, and I want to begin our time with a question because that's how James begins uh, his time. So here's my question. What are you looking forward to this summer? Right now in the Northwoods, it is just yucky. Uh, it's a little rainy, it's a little snowy, there's a little melting, there's a little freezing. And not too far south, it's all grass, but up here it's all snow. What are you daydreaming about right now? What are you hoping to do when it gets warmer? What are you looking forward to this summer? For a growing number of uh, people, gardening is becoming their thing. Maybe that was what you thought of when I asked you uh, what your plans were. In the summer of 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, 20 million novice gardeners picked up a trowel for the first time. I stuck at home, they literally had nothing else to do. And most of them replanted in 2021, and tons of them are planning to do it yet again in 2022. I've never been a gardener, a vegetable gardener necessarily, but I have always admired those who are. I can recall over the course of probably the last 10 years or so, 
four or five different times of some people up here in the North Woods taking me uh, into their vegetable garden and showing me around. I mean, opening the gate to the fenced-in area. And as they walk in, there's sort of a pace of just patience. And they kind of touch the, the leaves of the, of the plants in their vegetable garden. And they explain what's over here. And they might see a weed and pull the weed and throw it out over the fence. And um, there's just kind of a way of, of showing another person some hospitality by inviting them into um, the work that they've been doing, the vegetable garden that they have been tending. The best gardeners love it. They love getting their hands dirty. They love thinking about it ahead of time. They love choosing the vegetables. They love planting the seeds, watering, watching, even weeding. They love it because this is their happy place. And they're patient. They, they know it's not an overnight thing. It's not even a, a, a period of just a week or two. They, they know that growth takes a season. They know when it comes to gardening, they need to think in terms of seasons. And they know that at just the right time, with some help from the sun and the rain and the Lord of creation, that they will reap a harvest of vegetables. And it will be all the more, more enjoyable precisely because it has taken a long time. Well, there will be a day, it will come soon, when we can start cutting the grass and planting the flowers and sowing the seeds. But when we do, we need to be intentional. We need to have patience. We need to think in terms of seasons. I believe that James had that kind of thinking and analogy in mind as he penned this portion of his letter. And he used that exact kind of illustration in this passage to get us thinking about wisdom and about the growth of wisdom and about a harvest of a different kind. So here's the passage, James 3, 13 to 18. I'm just going to read all of it. It's not that long. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Thanks to the Lord for this, his word. Would you pray with me one more time? Gracious Heavenly Father, as we seek to have hearts that are open to you, I pray that you would plant your word deep within us. I pray that we would be faithful to nurture it. And Lord, I ask you for wisdom, both in these moments now and in, in, in the days and, and on the road ahead. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the goal of this passage is to stir our desire for wisdom like a, like a garden center kind of wants to stir our desire to garden so that we'll come in and buy everything that we need there. James wants us to, to stir our desire for wisdom. So he brings us through a thought process, and I just want to follow the thought process. It's a biblical thought process. It begins with a dialogue about wisdom in verse 13. Then it describes the opposite of wisdom in verses 14 and 16. And finally, it offers the definition of wisdom in verses 17 to 18. So that's the thought process that we're going to follow. So let's begin where James begins in verse 13 with a dialogue about wisdom. It really is a conversation starter type of question. Uh, my family and I just returned from visiting uh, my folks in Arizona over spring break, 
And one thing that we like to do when we gather together is to ask conversation starter type of questions around the dinner table. It just gets us talking and thinking in ways that we probably would never get to if we didn't ask those questions. That basically seems to be what James is doing here in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? That's the, that's the dialogue starter type of question. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. The community James is writing to seems to be marked by a measure of quarreling and arguments and some of them even violent. And it seems that in the midst of, some of, of all of that drama, some people are claiming to be wise. And so this opening question is kind of an invitation from James to them to just think a little bit. And then step forward if you think you're wise. James is kind of drawing a line in the sand and he's saying, okay, any of you who may pride yourselves in your wisdom, think about this and listen to what I'm about to say, which is this. A wise person will show their wisdom quietly, gently, reasonably. A wise person will show their wisdom. Actions speak louder than words. That's sort of what meekness means. It means uh, that a person is gentle, quiet, modest, reasonable, unassuming, humble. Probably the best uh, kind of pairing of a word with meekness is humility. Someone who is meek is also humble. Wisdom isn't about the best knowledge. Wisdom is about true transformation. Maybe you know um, the, the saying about knowledge, wisdom, and tomatoes. Uh, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to use it in fruit salad. It's about showing on the outside what has been growing by faith on the inside. And the word show... In, in verse 13, is one of the few imperative verbs in this passage. It's a command. Uh, like in the diatribe that James uh, lit into in James 2.18 when he challenged the foolish person, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. If works and faith can't be separated, then neither can meekness and wisdom. James is saying good conduct is important, really important, but it needs to be done in a spirit of humility, specifically a, a humility that is the result of wisdom. To be wise is to be quiet and humble. And by the way, all this would have been a really good conversation starter in Greek culture. Humility or meekness at the time was not a quality that was usually prized among leading Greek philosophers. They thought it signaled a weakness of character, that uh, somebody who was meek or humble was unworthy uh, of being a strong and confident person. But the New Testament, and Jesus in particular, paint a totally different picture than that Greek philosophy at the time. And it's so great to connect the dots specifically on this Palm Sunday with a passage that hails Jesus as our meek Savior. In Matthew 21, we have uh, the Palm Sunday account of Jesus riding in on a donkey, not a gallant steed, but a humble donkey. Uh, here's Matthew 21, uh, verses 1 through 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, 
Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks and sat and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. So, in Matthew 21, verse 5, in this passage that is um, recounting the Palm Sunday, the very first Palm Sunday, Jesus is described as humble. It's the same root to the Greek word that is translated meekness here in James uh, 3.13. The Christian meekness, the humility that grows from our hearts, the kind of of attitude that Jesus showed for himself, the kind of character that's, uh, that's lauded in the New Testament grows from the seed of awareness within every authentic believer that we are not in control. We're unable to grow all on our own. We are dependent on the Lord of creation. We know our position as broken and sinful creatures in relationship with the glorious and majestic God. And we rely on the goodness of God to nurture our hearts and to make us humble toward God and humble toward others. With that framework and that perspective, there is a natural humility inside of us that's authentic, that comes out toward God in our relationship with him And it's just present in others, uh, in our relationship with others. If Christ demonstrated a meek dependence on the Father, how much more should we? So that's the conversation starter that James kind of brings out in verse 13. And he evokes with his question, who among you is wise? It's a dialogue about wisdom. Then he moves on to describe the opposite of wisdom. In verses 14 to 16. In February of this year, I was at a theology conference in Illinois where one of my professors from seminary spoke, Dr. David Powell. He was my Greek professor in seminary. Super smart guy. And the topic that he was speaking on was the definition of hope in the book of 1 Peter. And he said something in that lecture. And just this last week, I went back and watched it again, and typed out what he said exactly because it stuck with me for the last couple of months. Uh, Here's what he said. I remember 30 years ago taking the SAT in Hong Kong, trying to get into college in the States. I found it interesting that in the SAT exam, I was asked to provide the antonym of a word. I found it uh, interesting And actually, just a little weird. Why not just provide the definition of a word? Why do we need to know the antonym of a term? Later on, I asked a similar question about certain biblical words, and I realized that to know a truth well, we need to know its antonym. And as an exercise with us that day at the theology conference, he asked us a question. He said, in the Gospel of John, what is the antonym of truth? It's not just falsehood, it's the world. Interesting. In the epistle 1 John, he asked, what is the antonym of love? It's not simply hatred, but fear. In love, there is no fear. For Paul, the antonym of thanksgiving is not just ingratitude or being ungrateful, but it's idolatry. In Romans, the antonym of faith is not simply being faithless, but boasting. To know a truth, we need to figure out the antonym and figure out why exactly is it the opposite of that truth. And then Dr. Powell went on with us to look at 1 Peter and hope 
and to define the antonym of hope in 1 Peter as our fleshly desires. That's the antonym of hope. So it really stuck out to me when I began to study uh, James 3 and look at wisdom and preparing for this message that he really is making super clear for us what the antonym of wisdom is. So look with me at verses 14 and 15 again and see if you can define the antonym of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Bitter jealousy and selfish ambition form the opposite of meek wisdom. It's antonym. Which is interesting because I think if I asked you gathered, uh, watching online, thinking about this, if I asked you what's the antonym of wisdom, I think most people, after thinking just a little bit, would probably say foolishness. The opposite of wisdom is folly. But according to these verses, the opposite of God's wisdom, the opposite of wisdom that comes down from above is bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in our hearts that is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. That's the antonym of wisdom. That's the definition of unwise, according to James. It's unwise to nurture bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. They are like weeds that need to be pulled out of the gardens of our hearts. In order to avoid this, we need to appreciate our natural capacity to grow these things within us. So looking closer at each is really interesting. The word jealousy in verse 14 on its own can be a positive or negative thing. It's actually, the same Greek word is translated as zeal. And it's uh, used of Jesus to describe Jesus. Actually, on Palm Sunday, after he got off of the donkey in Jerusalem, he went into the temple and he cleared it of the money lenders. And the, the same Greek word was used to describe what he did on that day, zeal. So it's the word bitter before this Greek word that's translated here as jealousy that turns it into something that is more negative, like an ugly envy. That's probably maybe a, a, a tangible way for us to remember it. Ugly envy. Bitter jealousy is like ugly envy. And this is paired with selfish ambition, which in Greek is one word. It's used only here in the New Testament. And the only other pre-New Testament use of the word was by Aristotle, and he used it to describe the politicians of his day who were obstinate and divisive and dramatic and narrow-minded and greedy. That word is used to describe the worst of politicians. James is saying some of you who pride yourselves on being wise are showing yourselves to be exactly the opposite. Bitter, envious, greedy, contentious, all of that is the opposite of true wisdom. On another level, if they are claiming to be Christians, with all of this envy and greed coming out of them, it means they're losing the battle of, of the, the Christian fight, the, the fighting the good fight on all three fronts. Uh, from the time that we're saved until we die, every believer has a battle on three fronts. We battle the drift of this world, we battle our own sinful nature, and we battle the enemy. My own walk with the Lord was so dramatically impacted when I realized that we're given the strength of the Lord, we are made new on the inside, but until we die in this life, we have three battle fronts, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And that's what James references in verse 15 when he defines the antonym of wisdom as earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. It's like the weeds have taken over. And they can easily grow in the soil of our hearts if we 
Just let them, verse 16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Uh, Disorder and every vile practice translate words that literally mean a restless and unsettled spiritual state. Restless and unsettled. Back to the gardening metaphor, it makes me think of a ravaged, overgrown garden. Now, I don't garden, but I've seen people in Wisconsin that have begun a garden, but then sort of let it go. Kind of through a lack of removing weeds or a lack of fencing out the animals. The Division of Horticulture at UW-Madison says this about vegetable gardens in Wisconsin. A vegetable garden can provide nourishing food, healthful exercise, and profitable leisure for people of all ages. Vegetable plants, like other living, growing things, have certain requirements. They need a good fertile soil, water, sunlight, and protection from their enemies. The successful gardener knows these requirements and carefully fulfills them at the right time. That's what we know about gardening. Back to the text. In verse 16, when James talks about disorder and a number of reasons uh, that he brings forth, uh, there are a number of reasons that when he brings this forth, likely he's referring to leaders. Uh, the disorder that leaders sort of allow in their communities. Uh, Like a committed gardener, a godly leader needs to faithfully guard their own hearts from the pull of the world and the temptation of uh, our sinful natures and uh, the, the trickery of the evil one. Otherwise, we know what happens because we've all seen it in the failings of church leaders, either from a distance or up close. And all I can say to that personally is that here in this community of faith, we strive as leaders, as pastors, as staff of this church to be real, to be accountable on a ton of levels financially, morally, uh, personally, strategically. I see this as the heart work that is the most important thing I do as a pastor. And I feel the call in this role, to guard my heart. But it's also a call for every believer. So James likely is really directing a good portion of this at the leaders in that community. But it's also a call for all of us as followers of Christ. Beware of bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. Be alert and on guard to the earthly and unspiritual and demonic battlefronts that we face in this life. Don't boast or be honest and prideful. Otherwise, the soil of your heart will become overgrown and lost to every kind of disorder. It will be a restless and unsettled state. That's the opposite of wisdom. Thankfully, James doesn't end on a downer. He stirs our hearts with a compelling picture of the definition of wisdom. So, There's a dialogue about wisdom, the opposite of wisdom, but then the definition of wisdom in verses 17 and 18. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. There's that metaphor of harvesting and sowing again in verse 18. But first, verse 17 Personally, for me, this is one of my life verses. I'm so grateful that the Bible defines for us uh, the nature, through clear definition, the nature of wisdom. And again, James is so action-oriented. In defining the wisdom from above, James primarily lets us know what it does, not just what it is. James believes that wisdom is a way of thinking and seeing the world. It's a God-given perspective that changes the way we move through the world and interact with others. Like true faith in chapter 2, the true wisdom in chapter 3 is defined by the quality of life that it produces. If you count the qualities in verse uh, 17, there are eight Uh, If you consider the first quality of purity as sort of an overarching 
quality. Then the rest, uh, number seven, and they sort of stem from that overarching quality of purity. Purity has to do with morality and innocence. One theologian said that uh, the next seven qualities are all dimension of that overall quality of purity. Like, our call is to a moral purity. Here's what it looks like in our lives to live a morally pure life. These are ways that we show our obedience to God. They're ways that if we are wise, we will live out our life consistently. And they're arranged poetically. So underneath that word pure, the next three words all begin with the same Greek letter and have similar endings. It's like they rhyme. Peaceable, gentle, and open to reason. Uh, This is exactly what the community that James is writing to so desperately needs. A a godly willingness to yield to others and not grip the wheel so tightly. Peaceable, gentle, and open to reason. That's what a morally pure life looks like. Another theologian defined the combination of these words as not a weak, credulous gullibility, but a willing deference to others when unalterable theological or moral principles are not involved. When when our core theological principles are not involved, be willing to defer, be willing to yield. Uh, The next two words, uh, mercy and good fruits, are connected to the phrase full of, full of mercy and good fruits. This means we love our neighbor, and it shows and the fruits of our actions. Jesus talked a lot about mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And the last two words begin uh, with the same, again, like the first three words, the last two words begin with the same sound and have a similar ending. They rhyme. Impartial and sincere. The word impartial means that we are not swayed by others' opinions of us, but maintain an undivided loyalty to God. And the word sincere in the Greek literally means not playing a part. To be an authentic follower of Christ, cultivating wisdom in our lives, we're not playing a part. We're being who God made us to be. And there's uh, sort of an honesty and a transparency about that. The person characterized by wisdom from heaven will be stable, trustworthy, and transparent. They will be the opposite of envious, selfish, and ambitious. Instead, they will maintain a purity about themselves. They will be peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, which is what the community James is writing to needs. It's what we need. That's verse 17. And then verse 18 again ends with just this this reality. A harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. The atmosphere of the righteousness of wisdom taking root and growing in our hearts and lives is a heart devoted to God's peace in Jesus Christ. We're familiar with his peace. It guards our hearts and our minds. We crave his peace. We long to live within it. And we want to sow it widely. We want to make it flourish in our spheres of influence. How is that going in your life interpersonally? Making peace. Being a person of peace. Promoting peace. It's God's peace being sown and lived out. And is it growing in your life? God, through the Apostle Paul, says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That's Romans 12, 18. So I know that what James is talking about here is a patience like a gardener that takes time. But I want to encourage you as we kind of get to the end of this passage. I want to encourage you uh, in, in one way specifically when it comes to peace. Don't wait. Be the bigger person and make the first move. The longer you wait, the longer you'll suffer. If nothing else, let the person with whom you are in conflict know that you care. Like the the cliche is totally applicable. 
People don't care what you know until they know that you care. So just at the very least, if you're in conflict with somebody that's close to you, let them know, listen, I value your opinion. I may disagree with it, but I care about our relationship and you matter to me. Trust that God's at work. Know that he cares for you. Know that he cares for the person with whom you are in conflict. Pray for wisdom within you and within them. Pray for them. I find that when there is angst and anger in me that I'm struggling with toward another person, to pray for them makes all the difference in the world. Pray for them. Pray that God cares for them and that you and them both can grow in wisdom. Peacemaking is the fertile soil for wisdom to grow. So don't wait. Sow it soon. And then be patient. When it comes to wisdom, the thought process for James in the last part of chapter 3 is to present to us a dialogue about wisdom. Who among you is wise? And then it's to help us understand what the antonym of wisdom is before then defining it super clearly. And so this spring, I just want to encourage you to think of your heart as a garden and to be very intentional about your own spiritual growth in this coming season. It seems that James is writing all of this because we have, we have a part in cultivating these qualities. Like a gardener can't expect vegetables to just appear, we play a role in growing in wisdom. If you want to grow vegetables, you plant them and nurture them, and it takes time. So it is with wisdom. It's that way with all of the best gardeners that I've known. There's a pace. There's a, there's a patience. There's a willingness to nurture. So when it comes to wisdom, plant it by faith and work for peace and have patience. Tend it regularly. And then expect a harvest. Here's the simple bottom line in our call as as. In the North Woods, winter wanes and and spring begins. Here's, Here's the bottom line. When it comes to wisdom, think in terms of seasons. Don't think in terms of just this instantaneous thing that is is produced in us. Don't think in terms of of a day or just in the in terms of knowledge. When it comes to wisdom, think in terms of seasons, because that's how James encourages us to think. Godly wisdom takes time, so let's take the time. When it comes to the pursuit of godly, enduring wisdom, we need to think like a good gardener and be willing to plant and tend in the quiet soils of our hearts before we harvest in the daylight of our lives. Planting is done through active faith in Christ and pursuing peace in meekness. Tending it is done by guarding our hearts, weeding, fencing, knowing the enemies of wisdom. Harvesting is done after time, knowing what the fruit looks like and making peace. When it comes to wisdom, think in terms of seasons. And don't wait. Start now and do the work it takes until harvest time. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its uh, living quality and the truth that you plant within us, Lord. I pray that you would grow within us your wisdom. Teach us how to cultivate it, how to uh, guard our hearts, to trust you. And I pray that in this community, that you would allow us to grow in your wisdom uh, and to see a harvest of righteousness produced. May we be this kind of community that that works for peace and makes peace in you. And Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.